But Mario, now it shows poles on top of the Very welcome to the today's session of the Transboundary Water um, uh, Security Governance Train. Uh, we'll be starting shortly while we are waiting. Uh, please go to www.menti.com and use the code 42684425. And then in this uh, map, please pin where you are joining from. We love to hear from you where you are coming from. And uh, also enjoy the music of the traditional uh, indigenous community music that was provided by one of our speakers, Dawn, today. Thank you. Transboundary Water is pivotal for sustainable development and global water security, serving 2.8 billion people, covering 42% of the Earth's surface and flowing through 153 countries. Enhancing water cooperation over transboundary water will be crucial for a water secure world. Managers and practitioners of transboundary water are important catalyzers to boost this cooperation. They have requested for learning opportunities on how to improve governance aspects of transboundary freshwater security. The course will cover water security, international water law, water diplomacy, institutions, management tools, and financing. The course is dynamic, engaging the world-renowned professionals and international organizations, and showcasing many case studies around the world. The course is open for anyone who's interested in the subject to join. We look forward to welcoming you to the course. Hello everyone, it is a great pleasure to warmly welcome you to this 12th session of the Transboundary Freshwater Security Governance Train and is the first one in the, 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 the series, the third series of uh, season of our series. We say third year, uh, third series because season because now we are celebrating the third year from the opening of the MOOC. 
My name is Yumiko Yasuda. I'm the Senior Transboundary Water Cooperation Specialist at the Global Water Partnership and the lead faculty of the massive open online course on the governance for transboundary freshwater security, which was developed by GWP, GEF IWN, along with many global partners and experts in the field of the transboundary water. Since opening its course in August 2020, the MOOC has attracted over 3,200 participants from 161 countries around the world, confirming the need and interest for learning about this subject. This course is available for anyone to take at their own pace, and now it is also translated into French, Chinese, Portuguese, Spanish, and Russian. These are the, all the video subtitles that you can actually see. We also have a dedicated French version of the course on the CapNet platform. Now, we, well, after we developed this MOOC, we wanted to make sure there is also an opportunity for interaction because we heard that people are always eager to interact. So in order to enhance this learning experience and to provide opportunity for people to engage more with the experts more directly, GWP together with the partners of the MOOC have developed this online interactive series called Transboundary Freshwater Security Governance Train. In this series of events, we are highlighting not only the key topics of transboundary freshwater governance, but also highlighting the various examples and expertise from different geographic locations around the globe, as if the train is stopping at the various locations of the world. Today, the, our train will be stopping at North and South America, Africa and Europe, welcoming speakers from all of these places. As I said, the MOOC is celebrating its third year of its implementation, and we are now starting this new season of our event series, which is the season three. We currently have three uh, events planned for uh, the rest of the year. Today uh, is the first of that series, uh, and the topic is on indigenous people in the governance of transparent waters. We have, we'll, we'll be uh, explaining the other two events at the end of this session. And today's event is co-hosted by GWP and United Nations University's Comparative Regional Integration Studies, CRIS. Today's session has two main parts. The first part is a panel discussion by distinguished speakers where they will be sharing the experiences on the topic and answering your questions. And the second part is a breakout session where you will all have opportunity to directly interact with the expert. We have a great lineup of session chairs and speakers for the next one and a half hours. And also we have, uh, after the event, you have opportunity to still continue the dialogue and questions and communication with the experts through our Transboundary Water Knowledge Exchange Hub. So please stay tuned until end of the event and thereafter. I just would like to say some housekeeping rules for today's event. Please note that this online session is recorded. Also, please always mute your audio during the plenary session unless you are given the floor to speak. This event will not only present a new knowledge, but will also welcome your input in the interactive part. So please stay until the end. We count on your presence throughout the whole session. Today's event, we have English and Spanish interpretation available. So please choose your preferred language. If you go to the bottom of the Zoom, you see the global icon, and then you can choose the language of your choice. So now uh, we'd like to go to a little bit of the warm up. Uh, to, as, as I said, today's event, we really try to make it as interactive as possible for you to be able to ask any questions. So while we were waiting for the event, some of you have already told us where you are coming from. Please go to on your mobile phone or on your computer, please go to www.menti.com and this use this code 42686425. My colleague has also posted a, a direct link to the chat. And then please uh, pin where you are joining from. We see a number of participants joining from Africa continent. Europe, we have also Asia. It's really great. I know it's very late in the night in Asia, but so many of you are joining from there. 
And I see a lot of people joining from uh, North America, Central America, and South America. It's really great to see. I just learned from my colleague, today was actually a national holiday in many Central American countries. So I was a little bit worried, but I'm really glad to see all of you joining from, from different parts of the world. Thank you so much. We are very happy to, to, to see that. So let's go to our next question. <clears throat> Have you joined the Transboundary Water Knowledge Hub? Yes or no? Okay, now we have one on one. It seems that more people haven't joined and they don't know about it, but don't worry. We will now be telling you about exactly how to do and if you have a mobile phone, you can actually scan this QR code uh, on this uh, uh, PowerPoint, then, you, it, then it will bring you actually to the hub itself directly. Uh, but I'm sure my, my colleagues have also posted the chat. Yes, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the chat, the link to the hub should be posted shortly. So uh, we will be, you will be able to find it. Okay. Um, so, yes, the Transboundary Water Knowledge Hub was created precisely for exchanges. And now my colleague will be in a short while explaining what it is. But let's go to the next then question. Can the inclusion of indigenous knowledge and representation in transboundary water governance improve the transboundary water cooperation? What do you think? Yes, people are answering, many people are answering yes. It's an important part of the indigenous, uh, um, the Transboundary Water Corporation. In our MOOC, we don't actually have any specific topic on indigenous people, but we do have a topic on the participation on the module five. I hope you have learn something from that if you have watched it. Great, so it's great to see a number of you are, uh, think that it's, um, it can really uh, be an, uh, improve the Transboundary Water Corporation. And to, in the today's session, we will hear a lot more about it. Now, I would like to then um, ask Lisa, my colleague, to introduce about the Transboundary Water Knowledge Hub. Lisa, over to you. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lisa. And as you heard already, uh, we have this um, beautiful online space for exchange and transboundary topics. Uh, you can see on the screen the, the QR code uh, for our community. And basically, it is a community of practice. So it's something like a um, um, very cozy online space where you can share uh, your uh, latest research or the projects that you have been working on. And maybe there is an event that you would like to promote with the wider community. That is a perfect space for that. There is a number of partners that we have for the, um, uh, for the hub, which includes, of course, the the United Nations University, uh, the UNESCO, the YGRAC, Oregon State University. So um, a lot of those uh, actors are very active in the research on transboundary uh, water management. So please, uh, we're looking forward to see online. We're quite often posting uh, different event opportunities, um, calls for um, for engagement or maybe even job opportunities. Uh, we have a large training coming up uh, next week for the Pan-African region on international water law. And we'll, I'm sure we'll be posting highlights uh, from the training uh, also on our hub. Uh, and you can see some of our members actually sharing their research articles there as well. Uh, so we're looking forward to uh, see you there. And uh, as a little bit of a snippet, I uh, will also remind you at the end of the call, but uh, at the next slide, you're going to be able to see that the discussion that we're uh, hoping to have with you all uh, online, you know, people always say it's not uh, enough time uh, during the, the online calls and in the breakout groups. Uh, so our, um, our dear speakers have agreed to, to stay on and answer your questions for some time after the session. So we'll see you online and uh, 
we're also looking forward to see your reflections on the topic uh, maybe something that um, like a longer larger comment that you would like to share or uh, some big, uh, peculiarities about the, the speaker presentations um, and so please scan the code um, the link is should be accessible to everyone so see you online and see you in the comments thank you so much handing back to Yumiko now great thank you so much Lisa so while you are in the session please sign up to join this community uh, we will be uh, waiting for your your comments there um, you need to sign up to the GWP's toolbox first but if you click the link it will direct you there and during this uh, session uh, in the Mentimeter that uh, you also had, the last question of the Mentimeter, actually, I'm sorry, I, I somehow skipped that part, is actually please typing in the question to speakers. So if you have any, if you come up with any questions while you're listening to speakers, please type into the Mentimeter that uh, you have just interacted. And then you can also vote the question. If you like somebody else's question, you can vote. Yes, here in this page that we will start to see, and you can also see other people's questions. So please start typing in the questions uh, while you're listening to the speakers. So that was a, an, a, in a icebreaker and introduction. And without ado, I would like to now um, move us to the main section of our today's, um, today's event. So I will, I'm very happy to introduce our event chair, Professor Dr. Nini Nagabatra. She is a senior fellow and a cluster coordinator of nature, climate, and health at United Nations University, CRIS, in Belgium. She's, she's been working on sustainability science specialist and system analysis for more than 20 years and is work experience. She's led and coordinated and implemented water focus projects in Asia, Africa, Europe, and Americas, working with several international organizations, CJIR, UNU, and IUC, and so on. She has a lot of affiliation. She's also a junk professor at the, at the, at the uh, McMaster University in Canada, affiliated with the Oxford University and Leibniz University, and so on. She's also the module coordinator of the first module of our MOOC, the first one on the uh, freshwater uh, security introduction. Um, the fun fact is that Nidhi, she loves the wildlife expedition, but she's scared of the house bugs. And I must say, this is a very similar fun fact to another speaker today that I will introduce later on. Her biggest achievement in life is sustain, sustain is to change, to adapt and to co-create a sustainable future for all. Great motto. Thank you so much. Now, Nidhi, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much and good uh, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's joining us from various parts of the world. So delighted to be uh, contributing to this event focused on indigenous agenda in transboundary water governance. Uh, while we will learn from our experts, I just wanted to take a few minutes to just give you what's happening in the international governance, uh, what kind of international governance mechanisms are available to integrate to and to facilitate participation of indigenous people in environmental governance and also applying to water governance. So uh, maybe in the next slide, the next slide, please. You'll see that uh, one thing which is of interest for all the people doing indigenous research uh, is to know about the United Nations effort, especially by the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, to organize a regular of uh, uh, high level forums, meeting spaces, platform and knowledge base uh, in, an, in one platform. And this is United Nations Indigenous uh, People's Forum. They meet uh, quite frequently to discuss common issues, to organize solutions from every part of the world. People come and discuss uh, their agenda at that higher level. In the next slide, you will see you will see examples of some of these governance tools uh, from 2000 onwards, focus on indigenous people and their right in environmental governance, including in water governance, have been recognized through adoption of various instruments and mechanisms. 
uh, mo the most important one of this is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indi Indigenous People, UNRIP, that was, uh, that was acknowledged in 2000 and adopted in 2007. Many member states of uh, the UN have integrated that in their own national policies and agenda to some extent or to a larger extent, depending on uh, uh, how, how, how this instrument was received at the, at the national level. And you can see uh, the, about the permanent forum, the export mechanism, and a special report here at the UN that takes notes of all research and development that focuses on indigenous people around the world. In the next slide, in the next slide, I just wanted to give you a quick example of some of the articles from UNRIP, as I told you that it is one of the most prominent uh, tools that's, uh, that's been used uh, for, for kind of negotiating or facilitating indigenous, particip indigenous people participation. And our, on our, some of our panelists today will also emphasize on it. But I just wanted to give you an overview that it has number of articles that talk about uh, how to best integrate uh, the indigenous agenda into natural resource governance, environmental governance, resolve conflicts, uh, and recognize customs, traditions, rules, and legal systems in doing so. In the next slide, um, just to give you an example that uh, UNRIP is certainly one of the key tools to recognize indigenous rights and responsibilities at the highest level. But since its adoption, there is progress at a different level from international, regional, and national. For achieving the rights of people has been very uneven. And various um, countries have adopted it, but some regions and some countries are still uh, have not plugged it or not integrated it effectively in their national policies. And as you know, most of the UN instruments or global governance instruments are not legally binding but they are more obligatory. So there is a gap that I, I also wanted to hi highlight in tandem. Next slide. Other relevant instru instruments that uh, you want to be, uh, you, you, you can find interest is, uh, is, uh, is being uh, channeled by other UN agencies looking uh, specifically into biodiversity or ecosystem levels, including waterscapes what, and wetlands. Uh, is the Convention of uh, Biological Diversity that adopted Article 8J of UNRIP and uh, made it as a part of their own strategy. Similarly, UN Habitat has adopted some other articles of uh, UNRIP and uh, specifically looking into housing indigenous people, their water rights, and especially uh, if it applies uh, to shared water systems. Next slide. Uh, and uh, might be of interest to some of you that UNESCO's policy on engaging um, indigenous people also builds on Article 29th of UNRIP and uh, specifically outlines that right to the conservation and protection of the environment and productive cap capacity of their land or territories and resources, including water resources, should be the part of uh, UNESCO's engagement at all levels. So uh, while, while we see some more examples like the FAO's policy that builds on some of the key points that you see highlighted in the, in the bullet uh, list on the top of the slide, you can see that various agencies are putting their best effort to adopt and adapt some of the, uh, some of the recommendations from uh, UNRIP, the Declaration on Rights of Indigenous People to ensure that their activities projects and programs, including those that apply to water systems and transboundary water governance are, are sensitive to rights and um, of indigenous people. It gives them a platform to, uh, to raise uh, their opinion and uh, for these agencies to, ca uh, to capture their perspective in their programmatic mandate. In the closing, in the next slide, in the next slide, I just wanted to also uh, uh, highlight that unconventional uh, you know, agencies like the World Bank have also had uh, had um, given space for uh, agenda on focusing on indigenous people. And this is really good news because that's how 
private sector and larger, uh, larger spectrum of stakeholders will get involved in this uh, agenda and it will help uh, scaling, it will help financing the indigenous research worldwide. One can say that. The next slide, please. If you could wrap up, Nidhi, it would be great. Thank you. Yeah, this is the last slide I wanted to uh, give you an idea that most of these uh, instruments uh, are based on uh, this very human right to water. That is, again, an uh, international governance tool. And uh, the indigenous research on water governance has really used some of these uh, fundamental guidelines very much in their in shaping their own narrative. Thank you, and look forward for, to our panelists to take from here. Thank you very much, Nidhi, for giving that overview and setting the scene. Now we would like to introduce three great speakers of today's sessions. So we have um, Andrea um, Meiji Uri, who is a coordinator of Bolivia medium-sized project on intergovernmental coordinating committee of the country of the La Plata Basin. Professor Dal Martin Hill, associate professor of McMaster University. And Professor Kenneth Yongbai Anchang, Director and University Center of Excellence for Promotion of Indigenous Knowledge and Wisdom in the State University, Owe, Nigeria. <coughs> Excuse me. So, next slide, please. So, the first speaker, Andrea, she's a technical assistant to the National Coordination of the Bolivia Medium Sized Project and Intergovernmental Coordination, Co Coordinating Committee of the Countries of the La Plata Basin. She's an environmental engineer specializing in water security, ecology, and conservation, as well as environmental management and natural resources. She has over 10 years of, of experience in implementing monitoring programs and environmental action plans to protect the area's indigenous communities. Her research field includes water security, transboundary basins, indigenous communities, and protected areas under gold mining. A final fact is that while she's rested in a tapir roost, where she got many ticks, the biggest achievement in life is to have the opportunity to learn the link between indigenous people and the nature and learn how to activate actions to favor for them. Um, sorry, Tech host, if we could just directly go to Andrea's presentation. Andrea, please, yeah, if you can just go down and then go to Andrea. Yes, Andrea, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I, ah, thank you. Bueno, yo voy a hacer la presentación en, en español para que pueda, pueda desenvolverme un poco mejor. Eh, bueno, en primer lugar, a, agradecerles por, por, por la oportunidad. Yo les voy a mostrar el, el caso de cómo se trabaja un poco en Bolivia. Eh, Bolivia es parte de tres eh, macro cuencas y cuencas transfronterizas que son... Eh, la cuenca amazónica, la cuenca del Plata y la cuenca endorreica. ¿no? Eh, estas cuencas eh, tienen una característica importante. Eh, la siguiente lámina, por favor. Porque eh, estas tres macro cuencas o cuencas transfronterizas están, tienen dentro de, 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 de las mismas áreas protegidas, que las podemos ver ahí mapeadas un poco en color verde. Siguiente, por favor. Tenemos también sitios Ramsar importantes que, como vemos, se sobreponen a las áreas protegidas que se tienen. Y siguiente, por favor. Y dentro de toda esta diversidad de ecosistemas y riqueza que representa también el recurso hídrico que está dentro de esto, tenemos a las tierras comunitarias de origen que se tienen dentro del país, que las podemos ver eh, en color rojo. ¿no? 
estas, estas eh, cuencas representan ecosistemas que garantizan la cantidad y la calidad del agua. Y asociado a esto tenemos la presencia de, de, de pueblos indígenas originarios que representan también un poco los protectores que tenemos de, esto, de, de la cantidad y de la calidad del agua. ¿no? Pero podemos ver también que a medida de que los recursos eh, presentan mayores presiones de uso, los conflictos también pueden incrementar en los territorios. Siguiente, por favor. Hoy les voy a hablar particularmente de la, de la Cuenca Madre de Dios, que se encuentra en la región amazónica. Tenemos esta región importante, Madre de Dios, porque representa un corredor y un paisaje de conservación a nivel de la Cuenca Amazónica, ya que tenemos por parte de Perú, tenemos importantes áreas protegidas como Bahuaja Sonene, tenemos Tambopata, en el lado boliviano tenemos a la Reserva Manuripi y tenemos a, al, a la, al Parque Nacional eh, Madiri. Esto representa un paisaje de conservación importante, un corredor de biodiversidad que es llamado el corredor, eh, el paisaje Madiri-Tambopata. Dentro de esta, de, de esta macro cuenca y de este lugar tenemos a la... A la tierra comunitaria de origen Tacana 2, que la podemos ver ahí en un color eh, naranja, que representa un poco cómo lo, las comunidades indígenas están también dentro de una cuenca transfronteriza y que enfrentan eh, ciertos, ciertos problemas. ¿no? Siguiente, por favor. Siguiente, por favor. Es importante destacar que la economía dentro de la, de la TCO Tacana 2 se basa principalmente en, los, en, en, en la riqueza del bosque ¿no? y lo que pueda ofrecer. Uno de los principales motores de su economía es, la, es la, la castaña, la venta de la castaña y el aprovechamiento de los frutos del bosque, como podemos ver la castaña. Siguiente, por favor. Tenemos otros frutos como son el azaí, que son parte eh, importante de, de, su, de su alimentación también. Siguiente, por favor. Y otro de sus, de sus actividades primordiales son la pesca. Entonces son pueblos básicamente recolectores y pescadores de, 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 eh, que aprovechan el bosque. ¿no? Siguiente, por favor. Pero tenemos problemas y presiones, como lo mencionábamos antes que eh, se enfrentan al uso, a la cantidad, a la calidad del agua, que es, eh, por ejemplo, en este caso, el avance de la minería dentro de estos pueblos indígenas, que como habíamos visto, son importantes ecosistemas que albergan también importantes eh, fuentes de agua, no solo para el territorio, sino para el, la cuenca global, digámoslo así, del Amazonas, ¿no? Siguiente, por favor. Pero, eh, ¿cuáles son eh, los avances que podemos ver en la gobernanza del agua? Y acá me, me he permitido poner tres escenarios importantes que, son, eh, que podemos distinguirlos claramente, ¿no? A nivel local, en la TCO Tacana 2, podemos ver eh, después de haber hecho una, un, un, un trabajo de campo, podemos ver que la organización que se tiene dentro de, de, las, de, la, de los territorios indígenas, eh, en, en, por ejemplo, en Bolivia, son importantes. ¿Por qué? Porque son organizaciones que se dan a partir de la, de la convivencia que se tiene con la naturaleza. Entonces, por, el, por eso mismo... Eh, la, el nivel de autoridad que se tiene a nivel de la organización local es bastante fuerte. Eh, la legitimidad que se tiene a la, al elegir a sus autoridades, la responsabilidad, la participación, la transparencia y la equidad que tienen en el momento de elegir a las autoridades locales 
es muy, muy fuerte dentro de la, de, 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 la, de la Tacana 2, ¿no? Por otro lado, el alto poder que se tiene para la implementación de decisiones que se toman de manera colectiva sobre el territorio es muy importante. ¿Por qué? Porque la convivencia, como lo mencionaba antes, con el territorio y la naturaleza y el uso también y el aprovechamiento con el que viven dentro de, 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 lo, de estos territorios hace que los, los, las decisiones colectivas sean eh, con un alto nivel de poder de decisión. Y por otro lado, sí se tiene una gran motivación para implementar acciones que puedan eh, favorecer al territorio en el uso y en el aprovechamiento de los recursos hídricos, en los recursos de biodiversidad, ¿no? Sin embargo, un problema por el que enfrentan generalmente es eh, la disponibilidad de recursos económicos para llevar adelante estos, estos, eh, estas acciones. Otro, otro escenario importante para los avances que se han planteado desde Bolivia eh, es la política que se presenta con los pueblos. ¿no? En Bolivia se trabaja eh, sobre la diplomacia de los pueblos para el vivir bien, que representa básicamente el rescate de, las, de los usos y costumbres que tienen los territorios indígenas para, eh, para poder vivir en su territorio, lo que ha derivado en que los... Eh, pueblos indígenas puedan tener un instrumento de planificación que es el plan de vida y el plan de vida hace que estos eh, 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 planifiquen, los, los territorios indígenas puedan planificar su territorio basado principalmente en un enfoque holístico con sus usos y costumbres basados en, el no mer, en la no mercantilización de la madre tierra eh, otro punto importante que tiene este, este, eh, la diplomacia de los pueblos para el vivir bien son las acciones colectivas que se generan dentro de los territorios indígenas y el diálogo intercientífico, que es uno de los puntos más relevantes desde mi perspectiva, ya que el diálogo intercientífico lo que va a hacer es eh, mostrarnos un espejo entre lo académico y los usos y costumbres y los conocimientos muy valiosos que tienen los pueblos indígenas para que de esa forma puedan articularse, complementarse y llevar a una planificación del territorio mucho más, eh, mucho más consolidada. Y a nivel regional también tenemos otros instrumentos de planificación como es el... Eh, el análisis de diagnóstico transfronterizo que se tiene a nivel del, de, la, de la cuenca amazónica y el programa de acciones estratégicas que ya son, eh, son acuerdos entre los países en donde damos prioridades a, cierta, a, a ciertos temas y entre ellos obviamente está el de los pueblos indígenas. Entonces, el poder relacionar estos, estos tres niveles de agendas de planificación es muy importante para que las acciones estén articuladas. Siguiente, por favor. Pero ¿cuáles son los retos que presentan, eh, que se presentan al tener tres, escena tres sí, escenarios en donde podemos ver una agenda local, una agenda nacional y una agenda regional? El reto desde, de, desde el análisis que se ha realizado es que estos puedan ser articulados y que generen acciones que puedan ser articuladas, integradas y que tengamos una gobernanza de abajo arriba y de arriba hacia abajo. Esto va a permitir, eh, va a permitir eh, consolidar la, la planificación y las acciones en pro de fortalecer a los actores locales para que los actores locales con todo el conocimiento que tienen de su territorio puedan, eh, puedan afrontar las presiones que se tienen 
respecto a los usos y las presiones eh, respecto a la cantidad y calidad en el territorio. Eh, bueno, eso es todo lo que quería mostrarles. Siguiente, por favor. Bueno, quería mostrarles ahí una foto de, eh, de Icha. Ella es una niña tacana que me ha apoyado bastante en el trabajo de campo que hemos realizado, tomando muestras y, 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 otros, y, y otras entrevistas que hemos realizado. Eh, es, esto para mí refleja la voluntad que tienen eh, y las, las ganas que tienen también los territorios de aprender nuevas cosas, pero también nosotros podemos rescatar muchos, 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 muchos aprendizajes de su de su forma de vida y de cómo enfrentan eh, día a día los, las presiones de, de, de uso y de, en la cantidad y calidad que se tienen y cómo enfrentan también desde, sus, desde los actores locales, cómo enfrentan ciertas problemáticas, pero también dan soluciones muy acertadas desde sus organizaciones. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Andrea. Very interesting presentation, really uh, talking about uh, different levels, uh, importance of looking at different levels as well. Thank you so much. The next speaker is Professor Dow Martin Hill, Associate Professor at McMaster University, Nohawk Nation, Wolf Clan, and from Six Nations of the Grand River, Canada. She was the first Indigenous cultural and anthropologist in Canada and continues to break the, the barriers in education and research. She founded the Indigenous Studies program at McMaster University as a graduate student and recipient of the Canada-US Fulbright Award. She's an associate professor at McMaster University in Indigenous Studies. The, her, her work with elders, youth, women, and community over 30 years has influenced her development of indigenous knowledge in academia, research, and teaching. She's also a um, <clears throat> principal investigator for the three research projects led by indigenous ecologists, ecological knowledge, and so on. She's working in a different, um, with artists in innovative technology, indigenous uh, technologies to co-create bilingual tools <clears throat> and so on as well, to, to increase the capacity of water monitoring in her community of six nations and the First Nations partners. Her specific research interest is in highlighting the ways of traditional knowledge naturally provides solutions in improving quality of life through attention to ecological practices, gender, governance, and indigenous knowledge. The fun fact is that Down has started her college career in fashion school designing indigenous suits and gowns long before she went to university. Very interesting. I wonder what she's wearing today. <laughs> And so Dawn is joining us live, but she has actually kind of recorded her presentation to be on time and also some integrating some other aspects. So yeah. please, um, the technical host will now uh, start the video. Both clan from Six Nations to Grand River and also the PI of the Oniganos project, which is three projects into one. Um, we live near the Great Lakes, so I'm really happy to be talking about freshwater security and governance. Before we start, I'd like to uh, offer some words that we do in our schools, all our meetings, all our ceremonies. We start with the words that come before all outs. I'm going to share Denise McQueen of students. So that's just a small sample of our worldview and the things that we do as a Haudenosaunee community. Now on transboundary, we're in the Great Lakes region. So as you can see, we had one of the third largest freshwater bodies in the world um, that we cherished as First Nations people. Um, here, this map shows you there's over 140 First Nations sovereign nations um, along 
the living along the Great Lakes that rely heavily on that um, water. Global Water Futures uh, funds our work and part of our issues around governance is the extraction of our water for large companies, multinationals. When we have young people such as you, Galenta, here who um, are going without running water at Six Nations and having to purchase water, we find this highly offensive and we're working really hard to stop groundwater extraction um, to preserve it for future generations. Chris Brackley's work in, uh, for the Canadian Geographic shows just how much money is made um, off the Great Lakes and the investments made to clean it up are well worth it because they're 0.4% of the gross national product of money made uh, by both the US and Canada, which when you accumulate all of the economies that uh, rely on the Great Lakes um, water being clean and accessible to them, um, its economy, if it were a country, would be uh, third behind the United States and China. So that's how much money it generates. So investing money in cleanup has proved to have great dividends, although we're not doing it fast enough and we're not um, working as hard as we should um, to invest more money in restoration of source water for drinking water, which is Six Nations problem. You can see here it's highlighted in the red, um, both the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe share these resources and we work along the Grand River. Part of our treaty territory, um, as you can see, is um, stretched out um, and, and the river is flowing from one end to the, to the other, but we don't, we don't control and manage that water and we'd really like to be able to do that. It has over 40 dams. So our Terra Story mapping project is a community-led project that not only has traditional knowledge, but language, reclaiming our culture, reclaiming our history of these areas and our teachings. And I'm just gonna share a small snippet of that. The thing made that rivers, Tony, would flow, flow two directions. So if you wanted to hit east towards the sunrise, you would just go on the north side of the river and that current took you that way. And you travel in a canoe with ease. And when you want to come back west and you just cross the lake, cross the river and go back. So his evil brother saw that and he went and stuck his hand in the water and he stirred it all up and he pushed stones, threw stones in there and he dug out so that there's dangers now in the water. But they also would look, some areas he made look nice, but they were actually dangerous. So like the waterfalls and that, things like that, the rapids, they look beautiful but they also can take a human life if you're not careful. So I just kind of- yeah. you know. So our project um, is trying to um, share traditional knowledge and Jock is sharing the creation story because in our creation story, the Great Lakes is made by the creator. It was given to us specifically as drinking water. It was known as sweet water. And also, you know, there's the bad twin who lives in all of us and that we, we need to pay attention to mishandling, disrespecting water and the dangers of water. I'm gonna leave you with Jock's words on what we should be doing as both indigenous people in the science community about the current situation and water insecurity most of the world is facing today. As human, human beings, um, scientists are, are doing all they can to, to bring that awareness. Um, indigenous people are doing all they can to bring that awareness. And they should be fortunate we're not saying we told you so, because we did tell them so. Yeah, we did. So, but we, we now, we, we know we gotta roll up the sleeves and we gotta put our best minds together to figure out some positive uh, um, actions and, and what are our options and, and who has solution to, to uh, deal with some of the issues that are happening with climate change. They're happening faster than science can keep up, really. So now that's all part, part and parcel of our prophecies and things that, uh, you know, that there's great changes coming. So I just wanted to leave that with you all to think about this for the discussion. And if you have any interest in some of the tools and education um, that we've produced for community and for the larger public, 
feel free to visit our website. Thank you so much. Look forward to meeting you all. Yawe Donita. Thank you so much, Dao. A very, very interesting uh, messages and really mix of different messages. Uh, Dao, I don't know if you have anything that you would like to just to quickly supplement. Yeah, um, sorry that some people <laughs> couldn't um, hear that. Um, I think as a quick overview, just to uh, fill in what people may have uh, not heard, is you know our people, the Haudenosaunee, have been living around the largest fresh body of water in the world, the third largest. And in 150 years, the, the settlers have um, uh, taken that water from being pure um, sweet water to, uh, in 1968, where it was on fire. So part of the transboundary agreement, that's the Buffalo and Cayuga Lakes, and our people are also Cayuga. Um, so, you know, here we are um, uh, trying to get access to clean water um trying to stop the polluting of our water um while we're also trying to protect our groundwater so we're being assaulted um for for quite a long time but from every direction and in canada and the us well canada's adopted some aspects of the undrip you know at the end of the day we're not at the table so while there was an agreement to clean up the great lakes and there was funding um, none of that funding flows to indigenous people and they're the ones that are, as our uh, Andrea said earlier, they know this river from the time it was created. They could talk to you about glaciers. They can talk to you about uh, the history of the land, um, the laws that are to go with that land of, of being stewards of this water. And in particular, women have always been the stewards uh, as a matriarchal society. Um, you're, you're born into water, your bodies are of water. So our teachings uh, that I was trying to share uh, are, are so intertwined from the Ganyo Hanyo, which is our oldest speech. And we recite it every day in our schools. It's not a prayer. It's not, it, it is literally a reminder of our responsibilities to our ecological world that they have rights. So in the great law of peace, which was uh, founded in 1128 um, by the peacemaker, um, there's 117 articles and laws that he put forward. Women had rights. Uh, women were the authority um, decision makers and they chose their speaker who was the male who now is called the chief. Um, they've always inherited those values of youth, of caring for the land and, and having a strong relationship, a spiritual relationship with the water. So having the some of the most powerful forces in the world upon you, which is the United States, they crossed our people. So you could see in that map, half of that is the US and half of it is Canada. Um, and and so we've really been left in, in a, in a uh, dispossessed from our rights over our waters based on, you know, then you have the provinces and you have the states and and there's just layers and layers of ways to marginalize our voice at those tables um, when in fact, you know, we have solutions on how to clean things up. What we don't have is the political will and the support of, you know, places that I'm hoping to, to secure support such as the UN, UNESCO and other bodies who could be very effective in ensuring that our people, particularly our women and our young people, are able to be at the table to start managing their waters in the way that they had for thousands of years and kept them in, in, in good condition. So I'm hoping that part of this conversation is looking at how we can continue to work together to elevate Indigenous people to the point that, you know, we should be governing our own lands and our own waters. Thank you. Yawe, Donnie too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dao. A very um, interesting insights and also some resonate to also some of the Andrea's point about these different levels of governance. Uh, now, our last and final speaker, uh, I would like to introduce Professor Kenneth Yongbali Anchang. He is the director of the University Center of Excellence for Promotion of African Indigenous Knowledge and Technology. He has more than 20 years of research in public health 
clinical microbiology and alternative complementary medicine and applications of indigenous knowledge in sustainable development. Kenneth has implemented indigenous, indigenous knowledge led interventions in public health and climate mental health life literacy in Africa. Very interesting. We are coming from someone on the indigenous clothing to now the health. Uh, Kenneth is a coordinated African Union Afrocentric Working Group on the use of indigenous knowledge in the control of COVID and other infectious disease on the continent. The fun fact that Kenneth is in love with nature and enjoy the beauty expressed in microorganisms when viewing them under a microscope still becomes afraid of them. So it's a little similar to Nidis. <laughs> fun fact. The biggest achievement of Kenneth is that he's been working with indigenous people led, that led him to discovery and innovation, which ultimately led to the award of the 2020 Mark Bopret Gold Medal by the Cameroon Academy of Sciences. So Kenneth, really great to have you here. The floor is yours for the five minutes intervention. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, uh, everyone who is participating here. It's really a wonderful uh, pleasure uh, to meet all of you, although virtually. Uh, well, I will share just some thoughts on uh, the African indigenous knowledge in water purification and water management. And what are the wider implications of this for transboundary water governance? Um, well, basically, uh, this is my outline which is looking at the concept of African traditional and indigenous knowledge in water purification, the myths that are related to water bodies in Africa and the application in transboundary water governance. Water governance in village and community setting in Africa, the traditional governance versus water governance in the cities, state governance as well. And of course, what are the indigenous knowledge in water purification? And uh, that introduces us to the use, uh, what we've done a lot of work on the use of, uh, you know, medicinal plants uh, as disinfectants in cleaning uh, water. Now, let me just put this in context. We cannot discuss all this, but one of the things I would like to put in context before I go in, which forms the nitty gritty of my talk, is the fact that before 1884, when they had uh, the colonization of Africa through the Berlin Conference, African community existed as independent states on their own, equal in majesty and equal in their own rights before nationalism came. And nationalism came, it was more or less the Europeans who were now you know, separating African, different villages. So if you look at water bodies in Africa, they had indigenous connotation and indigenous knowledge. And this, this is very interesting. You cannot by any way, talk about water governance in Africa by using state or Socratic governance because indigenous communities were one. We need to look at the history of how this community comes about. Now, if you look at all border communities within the Congo Basin and within Lake Chad Basin, if you go to look at the indigenous villages bordering these water bodies, you know, for, you know, they speak almost the same language, if not, and they share a common identity and a common culture. But because of 1884 Berlin Conference that separated them, they are now called Chad. They are now called Cameroon, they are now called Nigeria, they are now called Democratic Republic of Congo, but they share that knowledge. So next slide, please. Next slide. <clears throat> okay, so um, in Africa, there are more than 250 dialects and tribes and water bodies are held sacred. Some tribes believe that water bodies are deities. Rivers, streams, brooks are considered antics, spiritual, and there's a lot of eco-spiritualism along these border areas of water, irrespective of the community. That's one of the things that's very clear in Africa. And I'll take you to Cameroon. There is an ancestral connection with water. There are crater lakes in Cameroon called Lake Awing, Lake Oku, which are believed to be deities, and they're shared by different communities. This is interesting. There are positive and scary anecdotal water bodies. In Cameroon, those Cameros, the name derived from the Portuguese, meaning river of prunes, of prawns, which was shared along the Congo Basin. There was a lot of prawns in that, and that's the name of Cameroon, 
coming from a river, coming from a water body. In Cameroon, rivers and streams provide names for territorial and jurisdictional governance. If you look at the major river in Cameroon, River Wuri, the littoral province is named after River Wuri. That is, and there are many communities, you know, sharing that river. River Manu, River Mezam, River Donga Mountain, which is part of Cameroon and Nigeria. But these are territorial boundaries. And at the same time, national governance have named these rivers, named the provinces based using the names from the river. So this is very interesting for transnational water governance. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Now, this is the River Mesam in Cameroon. Okay, go back to the picture of the river, please. The picture of the river. Go back to the picture of the river, the previous slide, please. Yes, sure. Okay, great. Now, yeah, look at this river. This is River Mesam in Cameroon. It's in the northwest part of Cameroon. It is it traverses different communities and they have a historical origin before the 1884 Berlin Conference. But now this water now in the present day scenario traverses different counties and the counties are named by the national governors. Now the activities along this river are bringing in conflict. People don't have clean water, so they have to depend on this particular water. Now there is grazer, uh, you know, pastoralists grazing along this border area, along this river area, and that bring conflicts. There is fishing, and some of the communities are complaining that those communities upstream are overfishing and they cannot have fish, and that brings in conflict. So now, how do we handle these issues for transboundary water governance? These are the questions, and we have some models on this. Next slide, please. Next slide. Can if you could wrap up, it would be great, thank you. Yeah, next slide, next slide, please. So um, I've just mentioned this, and these are the issues that if you look at this slide, next slide, please, next slide. Just go on to the next slide. Move on to the next slide quickly. Now I've talked about the ancestors, the fact that, um, you know, um, water is a spiritual body uh, for most of these communities. And there is no way we can have transboundary water governance without bringing in the indigenous communities and using the indigenous knowledge to build first local approaches to transwater governance first, before national, before regional. Next slide, please. And I would like to say, while you're moving to the next slide, that we have come up with a work where we're able to catalog indigenous knowledge in water purification in order to curb water uh, governance and conflict issues in water for indigenous communities. So we identified plants that indigenous people were using to purify water. And in our work, we've been able to train different communities along riverine areas, where they're sharing a riverine areas, to purify their water using water coagulants, like what you're seeing on the picture there. And now the communities, this particular project has reduced conflict. It has reduced, you know, different perceptional issues, national issues on water and the community have been able to come into that community cohesion. And we've developed what they call a community of practice governance protocol for transwater governance based on indigenous knowledge for purifying water and for improving water and sanitation. That way, they don't have to fight, uh, you know, and that, and that is very critical for our work. And you can see the pictures there from our work. Now the last slide, please, so I can wrap up now. Let's go to the last slide. So conclusion. Local knowledge for water ethnography, local economic activities around water bodies, farming activities and drinking water are key critical indicators to build water policies for effective water governance in Africa. Providing skills in water purification, providing skills in local water farming and irrigation around these water bodies, around these areas of communities, improving local skills and relevance in reducing the burden. This would go a long way to reduce you know, uh, the burden and conflict around water bodies in Africa. And last but not the least, for any global transwater governance in Africa to work, we must go back to before, prior to the 1884 Berlin Conference to look at the indigenous African communities the way they are, not the colonial approaches in transwater uh, governance. That's the only effective way. And I would like to end at this level, but we have a lot of details on our work. And that is what we're doing at the Center for Promoting Indigenous Knowledge and uh, 
promoting wisdom and technology. And we have all these uh, areas. And I think it's very interesting. I'd like to thank you for your audience. And I always uh, appreciate when people listen to you. It's my pleasure. Uh, thank thank you. you so much. And uh, I'm so glad to hear we've got very interesting perspectives from all the three speakers, including on water quality, uh, joint water management and involvement of uh, various strategies to involve uh, indigenous people, which answer some of the questions already that were raised in the Mentimeter. But let me take one quick question that was voted as the, as, uh, the question that uh, many are interested in. So what are the challenges? Uh, and this is to open to all the panelists. Uh, I'll give them uh, one quick minute to answer uh, this question. What challenges uh, do you think uh, um, programs, projects, or states of um, encounter to um, to work with indigenous uh, communities to ensure that indigenous community uh, communities and their agenda are appropriately reflected in water governance at the national level, at the provincial level. Maybe let's start uh, in the same order of as we had the speakers. Very quick intervention. Gracias, Neil. Eh, creo que lo, los, los desafíos son empoderar primero los usos y costumbres que se tienen dentro de eh, dentro de las de los pueblos indígenas, ¿no? Una vez que forta, se fortalezcan los usos y costumbres, eh, se va a poder avanzar, ¿no? Porque si si se intervienen con otras acciones que vienen de afuera, creo que eso debilita lo que ya se ha, y lo que ya tienen construido los, los, los pueblos indígenas. Gracias. Thank you, Andrea. Don. We have to unmute. Sorry, I agree with Andrea. Um, again, it, you we have laws like and, and UNDRIP does recognize traditional law. Um, and stewardship over our lands and uh, our, our accumulation of observed and, and accumulated knowledge over thousands and thousands of years, as was noted in the IPCC report, you know, we hold 80 some of the world's biodiversity in our hands. We're doing as well, if not better than conservation groups. And yet we're doing this like I am with, you know, hardly any money, um, working 24 hours a day with very little infrastructure or support. We have um, a, a real need to be invested in. And I think that will allow us to get to the places we need to get to. So part of it is resource strapped. We don't get into those rooms. We don't get the invites. Canada started a Canadian water agency. It was very exciting. I, uh, Global Water Futures, 900 scientists were backing that six nations in our community. And it and they went to the political bodies, um, uh, which six nations is not a part of that, um, it, uh, what they see as a colonial um, uh, system, which is mainly made up of, of um, people that are, are not, uh, observing traditional law. So they're, they're kind of controlling who gets into that room and, and, you know, women are left out. And particularly, you know, as you may have heard or not heard, you know, uh, our young people are out there getting arrested, um, trying so hard, whether it's fighting against these multinational corporations and pipelines, trying to protect their water sources, and they're getting criminalized for trying to protect their land. All of these are really relevant to the larger discussion about governance. And, and if they simply implemented our laws, um, not only would I, I believe wholeheartedly the water would be protected um, and governance um, would be enacted in an appropriate decolonial way, um, but women would be at the forefront of that effort as would youth. But right now they're the two groups that have been silenced. Um, and I think that that part of these conversations that we're having here today will maybe um, help transform the way business has been done with indigenous people over the years. So I, I agree, it must be local, it must be observing our own ways of knowing and laws if we're going to have a chance at, at saving what little good water there is 
and restoring the water that's been polluted by multinationals. Thank you so much, Don. I know working together over the years, we've learned trust and redressing the colonial scars is two simple methodologies to get started. Ken, over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think I would really agree with my co-panelists, uh, co-speakers in, uh, in what they have said. Uh, I would just want to, you know, elaborate briefly. In Africa, we would, uh, it's very important uh, to have a dialogue with indigenous communities. It's a, it's a very key component uh, because these, uh, they know the history of that water body, of most of the water bodies in their communities. So uh, it is very important to engage them uh, in a very, very inclusive engagement, discuss with them, listen to them, and whatever solutions we're coming up should be a co-design approach. You know, for, so uh, in summary, um, first discuss with them. Uh, the error most national governments do is that they feel that because they study geography, they study geology, they know, no, or because they study history in a classroom, they know, no, we have ethno historians in Africa. We have ethno geologists in Africa. We have ethno geographers, people who know cartography without even writing a single thing, without even going to a single classroom. And they know the course of the river. I mean, it's very amazing. If you go to Lake Chad Basin, you talk to the indigenous communities, the people there, you know, the chiefs, the chiefs and the kings, they will tell you from 17th century, this is what happened along this river area. So they have that. And they are very, very rigorous and tough in oral history without not even a single word being written down. So if we engage them, uh, and that's what we are doing in most of our work, when we engage them, listen to them as specialists, then we can now co-design, you know, co-design the solutions uh, for transboundary uh, water governance. I think that's what is lacking. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ken. So glad to hear the word co-design, co-creation. And I think that's where some of these uh, mechanisms lie to move ahead. Over to you, Yomiko, for the next part of the session. Thank you so much, Midi. And thank you, all the panelists. A very, very rich discussions that we are now going to continue in a smaller group. So we are happy to introduce you to these breakout groups where you can choose your breakout room that you want to go to. We have uh, four speakers, uh, uh, three speakers plus one chair. They will all go into the different groups. Uh, so you can just jump into wherever, whoever you wanna speak to and ask questions. So Nidhi will be in the room one. Kenneth will be in the room two. And then the, uh, Andrea will be in the room three. And then, um, no, sorry, actually this is, um, <clears throat> ah, uh, sorry, Dawn will be in the uh, room three. And then uh, Andreva will be stay here in the main room. So main room here will have a Spanish English translation, uh, and then Andreva will be here. So now I think technical host will open the breakout room, and please choose which room you want to go to. <clears throat> if you don't know how to do it, please just type in the chat the number of the group or uh, that that or the speaker name of the speaker that you want to ask questions to and a technical host will help you to bring you to that room. So over to you now, everyone, please go to that choice, your choice of your room. I see many people are still here in this room. If you don't know how to choose, please type in the chat the number of the room that you want to go to. And our host, our technical host will help you with that. Okay, I see people are moving to the room. <clears throat> Again, um, room number one is Nidhi, number two is Kenneth, Number three is down, and here uh, in the main room will be Andrea. And you have about um, 15 minutes to interact. Great. Okay. So I think we can start um, <clears throat> conversation in this room. Um, if you can uh, close the presentation.
Great. So thank you, Andrea. And uh, I wonder if we can do a gallery view um, rather than a spotlighting. Yes. So welcome. Uh, please also feel free to open your um, um, <clears throat> mic or open your video to see each other so we can see each other as a small group. Um, Sorry, I'm speaking in English and Andrea will speak in whatever language that you like. Since we have a translator, but the translator has to switch between English and Spanish. Uh, please uh, don't speak too fast when you say something. So I would like to just to open the floor to anyone to ask questions. You can raise your hand or just open the mic and, and make an intervention. Any questions, comments to Andrea? or any general reflections, feel free. You can also ask questions about the MOOC. Can I jump, Yumiko? Yes, go <laughs> so, ahead. Yeah, thank you. I'm Liliana from Brazil. So it's easier to, to speak in English. And I would like to ask to Andrea, because uh, I am working on um, Acre River Basin I work for the government in Brazil. So how do you see the advancements of the OTCA agreement? And uh, what are the main difficulties that you see or opportunities to collaborate between the three countries, you know, in the region of Madrid? Thank you. Thank you, Liliana. Creo que Eh, la OTCA tiene un trabajo importante a nivel regional porque creo que un avance importante que tienen eh, estas macro cuencas son que tienen un instrumento sobre el cual se puede trabajar porque ya hay un acuerdo entre los países, ¿no? Entonces es mucho más fácil a partir de de estos acuerdos regionales y de estos instrumentos de planificación regionales, poder agarrar uno de esos ítems para poder articularlos a una, a, un, a una planificación un poco más pequeña. Todavía es un reto, obviamente, todo, todo, toda acción que se vaya a llevar eh, en el nivel de transfronterizas es un reto grande, lleva tiempo, pero creo que una forma de construir eh, acciones que sean permanentes es tratar de articularlas a las planificaciones también nacionales. Yo tengo entendido que en Brasil, por ejemplo, eh, recientemente se tiene el plan de seguridad hídrica que un poco articula estas, estas, estas planificaciones. Eh, creo que es un, un paso más para articular estas acciones, ¿no? Por ejemplo, desde Bolivia, lo que se está tratando de eh, gestionar o en algún, en, de alguna forma eh, dar pie eh, es a que tengamos una planificación que como les decía vaya de se construya desde las, los actores locales vaya subiendo a los niveles nacionales y se articule precisamente con estos niveles de planificación que ya son el plan de acciones estratégicas que se tienen a nivel de las macrocuencas pero también que cuando se construyan estos instrumentos podamos bajar también a lo a los actores locales no obviamente es un reto muy grande, que puede tomar eh, muchos años, pero eh, creo que los pasos hay que, irlos, hay que irlos dando en pro de que los actores locales, los, la, la, los actores principalmente las comunidades indígenas puedan reforzar sus acciones locales, ¿no? Como, como decían eh, lo, los colegas en sus intervenciones, Nosotros muy poco les vamos a poder enseñar a los a los a las comunidades indígenas porque ellos conocen a la perfección su territorio y es por eso también que 
desde Bolivia, por ejemplo, se promociona el diálogo intercientífico. El diálogo intercientífico nos va a llevar a tener esa interacción entre eh, una parte de la población que, que no estamos 100% en el territorio y las personas que están en el territorio que conocen muy bien cuáles son las presiones, las fortalezas, las debilidades. Por ejemplo, en, la, en, en Tacana 2 y en muchos territorios producen miel, pero ellos tienen saben diferenciar qué tipo de miel sirve para cada, eh, para cada cosa. Por ejemplo, un resfrío tienen un tipo de miel específico. Para, para alguna otra enfermedad, entonces tienen, ellos conocen muy bien cuáles cuál son sus, eh, sus, sus, los usos que tiene cada parte de la biodiversidad que tienen, que tienen en, en el en el, en el territorio, ¿no? Pero creo que comenzar ese diálogo y comenzar a ver desde lo local hasta lo, eh, hasta lo regional, hay que buscar ese camino de tal forma de que nos aseguremos que en los próximos años podamos tener una planificación o acciones integradas y articuladas. También esto es muy importante entre países, ¿no? Pero creo que ahí el instrumento que tenemos por el cual agarrarnos es eh, el programa de acciones estratégicas, el análisis de diagnóstico transfronterizo que se, que se, que se genera a nivel ya regional y de cuencas, ¿no? Entonces creo que son ítems que podemos irnos agarrando un poco para, para ir descolgando algunas acciones importantes, pero al mismo tiempo fortalecerlas con ese, con, con, con todo lo que nos vayan, lo que vaya a enriquecer desde los pueblos indígenas. Espero haber respondido, Liliana, a tus preguntas. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, that was very, very insightful. Um, any other questions from anybody? Andrea, we have about five more minutes. Please take advantage, Spanish or English. Bueno, tal vez comentarles algo, ¿no? De cómo en Bolivia, por ejemplo, existen territorios indígenas eh, de tierras bajas y de tierras altas. Las que están en, en, en la Amazonía, por ejemplo, son las tierras bajas que tienen eh, un tipo de estructura organizacional un poco diferente a la de las, de, de las tierras altas. Las tierras altas históricamente son pueblos que han estado constituidos en los lugares y que deben mucho de su organización social a, eh, a, las, a, los, a, los, a los hitos que tienen en cuanto a lo agrícola por ejemplo, a la siembra, a la cosecha, y sus autoridades siempre, bueno, en su mayoría, van guiando este, este proceso y son autoridades que van, que se relacionan, bueno, en todos los casos se relaciona mucho con la madre tierra, pero van rotando. Por ejemplo, ellos no, no pueden tener un periodo en el que representen a una comunidad por más de un año, por ejemplo, y constituyen mucho es importante para en, en tierras altas, por ejemplo, que se constituya una dualidad que es el hombre y la mujer en, en, las, en, en las representaciones eh, de la organización social. Entonces, por ejemplo, ese es un uso y costumbre que hay que respetarlo en tierras altas. Y en tierras bajas, al ser núcleos familiares que en su mayoría han sido pueblos nómadas, que van, eh, que son recolectores, que son pescadores, que son cazadores, tienen una, un, un, una estructura de organización un poco me, de familiar y nuclear que van eh, organizándose de esa manera en las comunidades, ¿no? Entonces, el 
primer paso para fortalecer también la gobernanza es conocer cómo estos pueblos se organizan desde ya hace muchos años, fortalecerlos y dentro de esto, eh, se, desde mi perspectiva, esto puede, eh, puede darnos una gobernanza mucho más sólida ya que ellos ya tienen su propia organización consolidada, ¿no? Entonces, eh, eso, por ejemplo, en algunos minutos, en, perdón, en algunos, en algunos lugares ha fortalecido bastante eh, en el ámbito de las áreas protegidas, por ejemplo. Las áreas protegidas eh, con, han constituido un comité de gestión para eh, llevar las acciones de protección y de conservación de las áreas protegidas. Y esto se ha rescatado de las organizaciones sociales que ya estaban eh, constituidas. Entonces, esto ha fortalecido mucho la gobernanza eh, de, la, de la conservación del área protegida. ¿no? Bueno, saludos a todos. Mi nombre es Lorena Martínez. Soy de México. Pues bueno, ya estamos celebrando acá el Día de la Independencia. Y justamente, digo, creo que las observaciones que haces son, son puntuales, porque algo que comentaban es que se aplica un modelo colonial, que lo hemos aplicado siempre y hemos llegado hasta este momento finalmente donde tenemos un gran estrés hídrico, que trabajo en la Comisión Nacional del Agua, y me gustaría ver cuál es tu perspectiva a futuro, justo porque los impactos del cambio climático van a llegar hasta las comunidades indígenas. ¿Crees que esto puede acelerar la manera en que nosotros entendemos a estas comunidades? Sería mi, mi pregunta. You can just answer in, in, in one minute uh, because they, we will be closing this discussion. Andrea, please. Gracias, sí. Es un gran reto. Los escenarios climáticos son un gran reto, ¿no? Tanto para la población urbana como la población rural y como los sitios los pueblos indígenas, pero creo que las presiones van acrecentándose y en ese sentido todos los, los pueblos indígenas, yo creo que el reto más grande es reforzar sus usos y costumbres. ¿Por qué? Porque de esa manera ellos ancestralmente han cuidado su territorio, el agua y todo lo que, lo que tienen, ¿no? pero también hay que reforzar y ahí viene el diálogo intercientífico reforzar algunos otros eh, conocimientos con respecto a estas nuevas presiones que se tienen, ¿no? Y ahí tal vez lo, los pueblos indígenas van a tener muchas más herramientas para poder hacer frente a estas presiones. Hey, thank you, thank you so much, Andrea, uh, and uh, thank you everyone for this uh, lively session. Now, uh, I'm sure there are more questions that you want to ask, but uh, the time for our um, breakout session is over now. And I think everybody is coming back, if I believe, from other rooms. Is that correct? Yes, um, 20 seconds. OK, in 20 seconds, everybody will be back. So thank you so much. But we can continue the conversation in the Transparency Knowledge Hub. Uh, I hope you managed to all sign up to the hub uh, during the event, if not uh, immediately after the event. So thank you so much. Well, just now we see everybody is now flying back from their respective breakout sessions. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you had a very lively conversation. And of course, time is Time is always not enough to talk about everything, but don't worry, we have a forum to continue this conversation. I would like to just to remind you, uh, and maybe Lisa can show the slide or the, or the screen. We have this uh, space for the post event discussion. Right now, um, in, uh, after, right now, after we finish this event, we are going to start putting some <clears throat> comments into discussion and i really hope that you can all join this uh, this hub please um i think you can you can scan this qr code 
in your phone or my colleague Tobias has also just pasted the, um, the link to the chat for you to join this hub. First, you need to sign up to our toolbox, but if you click and if you're not a member of our GWP toolbox, it will prompt you to actually sign up to the toolbox and then you will be able to start the discussion once you sign up and then join this community. So thank you so much. Uh, let us just continue the conversation over there. And before I close, I wanted to also uh, promote some upcoming events. Um, <clears throat> if the technical host can uh, share the screen. So I, I mentioned that this is now the season three uh, session uh, series. And uh, today was the first one, the session 12. And the next month on October 10th, we are um, happy to have this other session, the role of institutionalized cooperation in the shared basins. What's the recipe for effective basin governance? It's gonna be focusing very much on institutions, river basin organizations. We are great to have the chair of the session, Dr. Susanna Schumayer, who is an expert on this subject and also a module coordinator of the institutional module on the MOOC. So here is a link uh, you can see. Uh, also, my colleague has just uh, pasted the link for signing up to this next event on October in the chat. So you are all welcome to join the event. And then the, we also have the session plan for November 2nd, using the data in the transboundary water management and negotiation. This will be very exciting. We'll be co-hosting this together with the Oregon State University. Um, so Professor Aaron Wolf is also an expert there who will be joining us. So I hope you can all join. You will receive the registration information in due course. And then next slide, please. I would also just like to, to promote that, please, if you haven't done so, welcome to sign up for the MOOC. Uh, we are now starting the third year of this implementation. Uh, the videos are all translated into five languages. So you are all welcome to join and it's free to, to join. Um, unless you want to take a certificate, then you have to pay the edX platform, a small fee, but there's even also a scholarship for that. So thank you very much. And I would like to thank all the speakers, co-chairs, uh, Nidhi, down, Ken and Andrea, you have been so wonderful and dynamic in, your conversa in our conversation. And also thank you so much to our colleagues at GWP, Tobias, Elisabetta and Mario for making this session happen. Before we close the session, I would like to invite everyone to join our group photo. So if you can all open your camera and then give a big smile, even wave to each other. Yes, and then our technical host will be taking the photo of our beautiful faces from all over the world. So happy to see people everywhere, uh, from everywhere in the on the on this uh, on this globe. Feel like a big family. Thank you so much, Mario. Just let us know when your photo session is done. We are ready. Thanks, Yumiko. Okay, thank you so much. Um, now I would like to close the session officially. Thank you so much for joining us. And but now let's uh, we will see we will continue the conversation straight away uh, into the in the transboundary water knowledge hub. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining today, and uh, see you soon on the other side. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye bye.